Hey, what's going on YouTube? Welcome back to another video. So I've been having a lot of conversations recently about why it's dangerous to administer workstations or laptops or any device that an end user might use with a domain admin account. And yes, using domain admin is easy. Everything will work when you need elevated privileges, especially when you have to connect back to domain resources. But this video is gonna really try to show you how easy it is to perform lateral movement as a hacker whenever domain admin accounts are used to administer end user machines like a laptop or a workstation. So, all right, let's, uh, let's dive right in and check this one out. Here we go. All right, so let's set the stage. On my screen, I know I've got a lot of stuff going on here, but it's not that bad. We've got three systems that we're working with here on the left side. First, this is going to represent our victim. This is just our end user, Kyrie Irving. He'll sign into his laptop or workstation. He's about to get ready to do his business for the day, whatever it is he's about to do. On the right side, this is actually our domain controller, and I'll sign into it real quick using a domain admin account, which is LeBron James. And we'll sign in, this is the nba.local domain. If you open up Active Directory users and computers, you can see Kyrie Irving is, is in here. And he's just a part of the regular domain user group. But he does have local admin rights on this system in this particular scenario. We just do who am I? We can do net user K Irving to get the full details about his user account. Again, we see he's a part of domain users. So the other thing I wanna check while I'm here is we'll just do a quick IP config, and we know that the IP of this target workstation is 10.01.200. While we're here, we'll do the same thing on the domain controller, just to see what IP we're working with. And that here is 10.01.10. .10. So the third system that we're working with is this guy. This is going to represent our attacker system. It's just running Kali Linux. This is a part of the same local network. It's on 10.01. Uh, dot zero slash 24 it's part of that same local network but everything I'm about to show you this could also uh, occur over the internet the same type of attack can happen over the internet I just happen to be all on the same local network because I don't want to deal with routing it over the internet and all that type of stuff so here we are Kali Linux system all right first thing we need to do is we need to simulate compromising that victim here on the left side so there's a lot of ways we could do this. Uh, the most simplest is just to go ahead and spin up a meterpreter payload and transfer that to this system and run it. So I like to use, I actually wrote a blog post that's got almost like a cheat sheet. If you go out to infiniteLogins.com, you can just come in and search for MSF Venom. And you've got this cheat sheet here that has both non meterpreter binaries as well as some meterpreter binaries when you get further down. So we're dealing with a Windows system slash x64. So this is the command that we want to run. And we'll go ahead and throw that here into our notepad. So we got to make a couple changes. First, we need to add L host and L port. And what we're doing is we're running a utility called MSF Venom, which is just a utility that you can use to generate your own meterpreter or non-meterpreter binaries, but in our case, we're gonna be using a meterpreter payload. And when you do this, you'll end up getting this file here, this exe file, that when a victim runs it, it's going to issue a reverse connection back to your attacker system at whatever address you specify here on whatever port you put here. So what I need to do is figure out again, hey, what's my IP? So we've got 10.0.1.6. So I'll copy that, update that there. On the port, you can use whatever you want. I'm gonna use a port that's most likely to be allowed outbound, and that's gonna be something like port 80, 443, maybe even 53 for DNS. That's typically what I like to use because sometimes you have firewall rules that are kind of filtering traffic on certain ports, and this can sometimes help you get around that. So if you go back to your system, and you actually run this command, this is going to generate a payload for you with the values that you specified. 
and it's going to dump it into shell-x64.exe. So if I were to list out the contents now, we actually have this file here. So I need to get this over to the victim. And again, there's a number of ways that we could actually pull this off in the real world. In this case, we're just going to simulate as if this system is already compromised. So I'm just going to transfer the file pretty easily by just spinning up a quick web server. You use Python, Python for that. So running this command, and I actually need to, oh, it says that port 80 is already in used. I'll just say port 8080. I must have another web server already running. So now back on this uh, computer here on my attacker system, I'm running a web server that's hosting up this shell x64 exe. So from the victim machine, we can just go out and try to download this file. So I'm at 10.0.1.6, port 80.80, and it didn't really like that, so we'll add HTTP in front of it, 10.0.1.6, port 80.80. Okay, and you can see we actually see the directory listing here for that file. We can download this, and I'm just going to save it down to disk for now. We can open up the downloads folder where that got saved to. So I don't want to run this quite yet, because there's one other step we need to do here on this side. So let's kill our web server. We've already transferred our file, so we don't need that anymore. And then we're gonna load up MSF console. This is just Metasploit, super, super common. Really, this is like as newbie as it gets as far as like point and click type exploits go. Um, but it's also really, really awesome. It's a really cool utility. It's got a lot of, uh, it's got a lot of things that you can do that can really assist you as a pen tester. So we loaded up Metasploit, and we need to use a module in here called the exploit multi-handler. By default, it's going to try to just use this generic payload, but I want to use the payload that we had just selected here in our MSF Venom command. So I'm going to copy this payload out, and I will set my payload to that. If we look at the options, there's a couple other things we need to give it, like with L host, L port. This is exactly what we had just done a moment ago in our MSF Venom command, so you just need to rerun set L host. Except you can actually use the interface. You don't have to just use the IP address if you'd like to. You can use the interface name. In this case, throw in the IP, and then we'll set our L port to 443, because that's what we had previously. And now when you run options, everything that's required is ready to go. We're using our Meterpreter reverse TCP shell. So I'm gonna run this. At this point, I have started a handler and I'm just waiting for a connection. So I'll move this over a little bit. Uh, make sure you guys can still see it though. Put it like right there. And what's gonna happen is we're going to run this file. Now again, there's a number of ways that we could do this. Um, we could perform some sort of client side attack. So that way when they use an outdated browser, or they go to an insecure website, it automatically runs this file. Maybe I have it embedded into a malicious office document. They open that document, boom, this macro runs this file. There's a number of ways to pull this off. In this case though, we just simulated, all right, this system's compromised, but they don't even know it. So on the right side, we do see that this session opened up. So I'm gonna move this into the middle here. And we can do a couple things. Like first, if I just drop into a quick shell, I can say, who am I? And we can see that we are this K8 Irving user. Um, awesome. We, you know, at this point, the attacker is gonna probably do some enumeration, try to figure out, you know, what groups is this user in? So we'll do that. And we can see, oh, all right. He's just a domain user. So we didn't get any special group membership that could help us with lateral movement. So what do we do here? Well, let me show you this. So let's exit out of our command shell. We're back into our interpreter window. And the first thing I wanna do is I wanna try to get actual system access on this system. So you can just run get system and we got it. Cool, so that does mean Kyrie Irving was a local administrator. We were able to get system level access to the system. So now if I drop back into shell and do a who am I, you can see we're actually running as NT authority system. That's the highest level of privilege that you can have on a single machine. Once you have system level access, you can actually use a module here called incognito. So 
So we're going to load that up. And then we're going to say list out tokens. And we have to provide whether we want to see tokens in user format or in group format. I'm going to say user format. And this is a list of all of the users that are currently logged into this system. Notice we've got K Irving in the list, and we've also got some various, you know, system level processes. You could run this again with a dash G, and you can see, okay, great, we've got all these groups. NT service, most of these all just seem local. Same with NT authority. And we're not seeing any domain groups that are going to help us with lateral movement. But this is where the, the actual lesson of today comes in, is as soon as a domain admin signs into this system, provides domain admin credentials for any reason, we should be able to impersonate that user session. So just as a quick proof of concept, I'll just say switch user real quick. And if I were to actually come in here and sign in as L James, which again is our domain admin account, maybe I'm doing this because this system lost domain group membership and it needs to be joined back to the domain. Maybe I'm just installing some new software and I'm tired of dealing with UAC prompts. There's a number of reasons why domain admins are signed in on end user workstations or laptops. Um, but this is this is what the impact is, okay? So we just signed in as L James. Now what happens if I say, okay, show me tokens again. This time, notice how we actually have NBL, NBA slash L James listed here. And if I do show me the groups that are available on the system, we can scroll back up here to the top and check this out we have NBA domain admins available for us to impersonate. So at this point, actually elevating to domain admin is super simple. All we have to do is run impersonate user, and then you specify the user. You also have to escape these slashes here. So put two of them there, and I probably need impersonate token, not user. Boom, all right, so we successfully impersonated NBA L James. So now if I drop back into a shell, and I do a quick who am I, you can see I'm actually signed in as NBA L James at this point. You do a net user on L James from the domain, and you can confirm he is indeed part of domain admins. So from here, actually pivoting to a domain controller is pretty trivial. Let me move this back to the center about like that. All we have to do is run a command like net user, I don't know, call it hacked um, with a password of password one, two, three. And we want to add that to the domain. So what we just did is we created a new user account called hacked using this password and we added them to the domain. Now what we can do is you can do net user, sorry, net group. And then we want to add them to the domain admins group. The user account we want to add is hacked, and we want to say domain slash add. Perfect. That command completed successfully. So at this point, if you were to do a net user on hacked and look at him in the domain, there's a new user here with a password that we now control who's a part of this domain admins group. So I could open up like a new tab and say remote desktop was enabled on that domain controller, you can just run this command to actually connect into the domain controller, username of hacked, password123 on the NBA domain. And just like that, we have compromised a domain controller without ever needing to actually know the domain admin user password. So that's it. I hope this actually made sense. I hope you found value in this. I hope you understand, you know, part of the reason why consultants will talk about not using domain admin accounts to administer workstations. Some other options, some mitigations you could do with this is taking a tiered approach to your user accounts in Active Directory. Perhaps maybe just administer your local workstations or laptops with a local admin user account or consider creating a, a series of domain admin accounts or domain user accounts 
so that way domain admins can administer only domain controllers. Then maybe you have another set of admins that have access to administer servers, but not workstations and not domain controllers. And then a third set of accounts that can administer laptops and workstations, but not any servers. There's a lot of possibilities and what type of approach you want to take. Some solutions like Centrify or uh, CyberArk or any of those PAM solutions should be able to assist with making this process a little bit easier for you. But it's definitely not an easy process to implement, but you can see the importance of it. It was a pretty trivial attack. Um, and really, it's, it's really just a process thing. You know, as soon as people quit signing in with domain admin rights on laptops, this attack vector completely goes away. Anyway, let me know what you think. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, happy to help. Until then, I will see you in the next video.